This video was brought to you by Skillshare. Since Ukraine's counteroffensive began last month, most of the fighting has been concentrated in the south, and the front lines haven't really moved all that much. However, in the last couple of weeks, things seem to have changed. The fighting is now apparently mostly in the east, where in the last couple of days, the Russians have pushed east from Svatova, and the Ukrainians have retaken a suburb to the south of Bakhmut. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what's happening in Donbass and Kharkiv, its strategic significance, and what might happen next. Before we start, TLDR EU is currently only just behind TLDR UK's subscriber count. So if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and help TLDR EU win the subscriber race. So let's get straight into what's happened over the last few days. Now, as I mentioned, there's been significant movement in basically two places. In the northernmost part of the front lines, near Kupyansk and Svatova, where the Russians broke through Ukrainian lines early this week, advancing by a couple of kilometers, and in Klitschkova and Andrivka, two suburbs just south of Bakhmut that the Ukrainians captured over the past couple of days. Let's start, though, with Russia's advance in Kupyansk and Svatova. For context, Kubiansk is a small town with a pre-war population of about 30,000 people in the Kharkiv Oblast on the Oskil River that the Ukrainians recaptured last year as part of their Kharkiv counteroffensive. Svatova is a similarly sized town that sits about 30 kilometers east that the Russians captured in the first few days of the war and has since been under Russian control ever since. Now, both towns are strategically significant because of their importance to Ukrainian and Russian logistics, respectively. Kubiansk is an important railroad junction in the area, while Svatova sits on the P-66 highway, which the Russians use to supply troops to Bakhmut and surrounding urban areas. Anyway, we first saw signs that Russia were planning on some sort of counteroffensive here over the weekend of July 15th and 16th, when Russia started amassing a significant troop contingent in the area. During a national telethon on Monday, a spokesperson for Ukraine's Eastern Command warned that Russia had gathered some 100,000 troops in the area. And a day later, on Tuesday, a small forward grouping of Russian troops established a bridgehead on the western bank of the Zehebets River, a tiny river that had basically become the de facto front line in the area since Ukraine's Kharkiv counteroffensive. A couple of days later, the Russians also established a second bridgehead on the western bank of the river, this one a couple of kilometers north of the first one. In the next couple of days, the Russians made further gains from this second bridgehead, and over the weekend, they managed to squeeze the Ukrainians between the two bridgeheads and combine them. The Ukrainians then had to retreat from their positions along the river, allowing the Russians to advance a few kilometers over the past couple of days, before reaching a second line of Ukrainian defenses, which they were unable to breach. Now, it's important not to overstate the significance of these gains. The front lines have only moved by a couple of kilometers after all, and Russia has mainly recaptured fields and a couple of rural hamlets. Nonetheless, it is the most significant Russian advance for quite some time, and the Ukrainians in the area no longer have a river to bolster their defensive lines, which means that further gains are at least possible. All right, so let's move on to the second place where something's happened, Bakhmut, and more specifically, its southern suburb of Klitschkova. Now, we talked about this in our last Ukraine update, but basically, Klitschkova sits at the bottom of a valley, and last week, the Ukrainians captured the high ground surrounding the town. This effectively gave them fire control over the city, which meant that Russian positions within the town were becoming increasingly tenuous. Then, when a couple of days ago, the Ukrainians captured the mini-suburb of Andrivka, which sits just to the south of Klitschkova and along the road that the Russians had previously been using to supply troops to the suburb, the Russians were functionally encircled, and it became clear that Ukraine was about to take the suburb. As of Wednesday morning, the Ukrainians have apparently forced the Russians to the northeast of Klitschkova, and they'll most likely have captured the entire thing by the time this video comes out. Now, this advance is clearly symbolically significant. Bakhmut is basically the only significant settlement that the Russians have captured over the past year, so losing it would be deeply humiliating and terrible for Russian morale. However, it's not all that strategically significant. 
while it might force Russian forces to redirect some of their forces away from Svatova and Kupiansk, which could be good news for the Ukrainian troops in Kharkiv, Bakhmut is now basically just a pile of rubble with limited strategic value, and its capture would be unlikely to precede further Ukrainian advances. Similarly, as thrilled as Russian telegram channels might be about it, Russia's advance around Svatova is a very limited strategic advantage too. Because while the Russians might be able to take a few more fields and hamlets, there's basically zero chance they'll be able to cross the Oskil River, given how much trouble and manpower they've had to expend to even take a few fields. The point we're making is that while Ukraine might be able to eventually take Bakhmut, without a significant change in firepower, neither side looks likely to make any territorially or strategically significant advances anytime soon. To be clear, we're not saying it's impossible, and if there's one thing that's been consistently true throughout this conflict, it's that Ukraine can outperform expectations. Nonetheless, the fact that the front lines have remained essentially stable for so long does suggest that something needs to change for the balance of power on the battlefield to shift significantly. This might actually explain why the Kremlin are apparently considering another wave of mobilization. Early this week, Russian MPs in the Duma voted on a bill that would raise the top age of military conscription from 27 to 30 and prohibit conscripts from leaving the country. And this presents Ukraine's Western backers with a bit of a dilemma. While the obvious move would be to give Ukraine more and better weapons in order to break the deadlock, this is no longer quite as viable a strategy as it once was, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, with the possible exception of the US, Western stockpiles are running pretty low, and maintaining the current level of support for Ukraine would probably require some sort of industrial mobilization, which is going to be politically more difficult. Secondly, Western leaders might be wary of sending more equipment from their already depleted stockpiles when there's no guarantee of further gains. And as such, more dovish parties in the West might prefer to sue for peace instead of taking that risk. Ultimately then, if anything significant is going to change, then one side needs to take action. At the moment, it's not clear which one is more likely to do so. So you really ought to keep paying close attention to this situation to see who moves first. In fact, that's probably not a bad idea more generally. Things are always changing, and it feels great to stay on top of them as they do. Even within TLDR, I've recently shifted my video editing workflow from Final Cut to Premiere in order to better integrate with the Adobe products our growing team of editors prefer. Now, when I started with YouTube, I just messed around and taught myself Final Cut. But this time around, at the advice of my team, I headed over to Skillshare to take their course on the topic. Unlike when I taught myself the first time round, I was guided through the process quickly and efficiently, and barely lost any productivity as I shifted from one tool to the other. It's not just that either. You likely already knew that Skillshare had classes for things like photography, editing, and illustration, but Skillshare also has hundreds of career-focused classes too. Now, we all know at this stage that traditional jobs aren't one size fits all. I mean, I quit my full-time job in marketing so that I could take more control and do YouTube full-time. Now, that's not necessarily the path that you want to take too, but the courses on Skillshare can help you design a career that fits you. That's courses on everything from how to start a business, growing in e-commerce, how to maximize your workflow, or the course I'm taking right now on how to build a business that lasts. And if that sounds interesting, you should use our link in the description, which gives you access to all of that for free. That's right, the first thousand people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So check it out and thanks for supporting the channel.